This is BBC Two, now with a final working lunch for the week. We join Adam Shaw. Good afternoon, I'm Adam Shaw. Welcome to today's hour-long working lunch programme. Tesco wants to corner the convenience store market, but there's calls for the government to block their plans. On the markets, the FTSE is falling and an interest rate rise in the next couple of weeks could be on the cards after stronger than expected growth figures. And Damien Larkin will be larking around with what's coming up in the city next week. Plus, I'll be asking this man, you might have guessed that was coming up somehow. Anyway, asking this man about how he makes his money. Good stuff. Uh, coming up too, how to make your business stand out in the scrum. Using technology is helping a rugby club bar pull the perfect pint. But first, Tesco, one of the kings of the out-of-town shopping centres, is heading back into town by buying another chain of small shops on the high street. It's paid £54 million for Administor, which operates the Europa, Hearts and Cullens chains. But Tesco's move has provided food for thought for some of the other players in the market. Big Food Group, for instance, which owns Iceland, wants the government to block this deal. And some analysts fear consumers may lose out. It's going to be bad for the consumer. When you go down the high street, you'll find the same names cropping up over and over again. Then you go to your neighbourhood, back home, and you'll find the same names cropping up there as well. Uh, is that really what we want? Also, it's bad for the small business sector. Britain desperately needs a small business sector where little people can start their own enterprises and gradually become bigger and bigger. When you're up against Tesco, will you really start a shop? I don't think so. Well, Gillian will actually have more on that deal at half past 12. In the meantime, if you have anything you want to say about this issue, indeed ask, email us straight away. We'll try and get to it on the programme. The email address, if you didn't already know, working.lunch at bbc.co.uk. Get those coming in. Now, there's more talk that interest rates may rise in the next couple of weeks after new figures showed that the economy is growing faster than expected. GDP rose by 0.9% in the fourth quarter. That's its strongest rate in almost three years. It means it's growing at over 3.5% per year. Now, the thinking is that if the economy is growing that fast, interest rates, well, they might have to rise because inflation could get out of control if the economy is growing that quickly and the government doesn't want inflation to get out of control. Well, news that Tesco, that we mentioned, is itself on a buying trip, hasn't done an awful lot, I've got to tell you, for their share price. Down 1.3%, 242. In fact, amongst the big boys in this market, there's not a single gainer. Safeway and Morrison's unchanged and the rest are down. Some have filled the, the worst, 2.5% just down this morning. Looking around some of the more widely held shares, a bit of a mixed day, I suppose more down than up, and I think that's probably a fair reflection. FTSE 100 is probably just slightly down. FTSE now uh, down 15, 4,462. Some important results coming out next week uh, from quite a wide selection of companies. Not an awful lot on Monday, so let's kick off uh, with Tuesday. Finals uh, from Armour Holdings, the high-tech people. On Wednesday, finals from Northern Rock, the bank. On Thursday, finals from the pharmaceutical company AstraZeneca and Autonomy Corporation. And on Friday, a much smaller company, I suppose, but interesting, uh, the tea company, Wittards of uh, Chelsea, report their interim results. Well, Damien Larkin from the Share Centre uh, is over here. Hi, Damien. Hi, Alan. How are you? I, I'm fine. Uh, thank you. Um, I suppose we should start with congratulations, because if my memory serves right, your choice last year actually did rather well over the whole year, didn't it? Apparently it did, yeah, Tesco's. Yeah, very nice indeed. Uh, what, what do you think of the market at the moment? I think um, prospects look particularly good. I think we've got an economy which is recovering. You said in the previous piece about GDP looking strong and most of the statistics are supportive of the market rising further so I'm, I'm pretty happy. You'd buy in at these levels? I would, yeah. What sort of sectors? The sectors I prefer at the moment are cyclical sectors. That's uh, sectors which are more geared to the market so they, they're more sensitive to economic recovery so things like uh, chemicals, um, things like uh, construction stocks, uh, anything really which will see its demand go up more 
than the defensive stocks which are stapled like food retailers and food producers so and completely like. you chose Tesco you wouldn't have Tesco for this year you'd go into something else now I probably would um, if I was going to make one exception it might be Tesco's because Tesco's despite the the trends in the economy is actually a fantastic company okay let's have a look at we, I talked about a few things coming up next week we had a chat earlier and you, you highlighted a couple of others legal in general we might be able to have a look at their uh, share price actually over the past uh, year uh, rather nice it is um, uh, the full year sales figures coming out next week, is that right? That's right. We're expecting to see a fall of about 4%, which, which may sound bad, but put into context, all, you know, share price has done well, but, uh, you know, over the last year and, and the previous two years, we've seen pretty disappointing markets. So consumer sentiment for, uh, you know, buying life assurance and uh, investments and saving products has gone down. So only a 4% fall is, is not too bad, really. Okay. Uh, uh, the other one, Vodafone. Uh, it's, it's hugely important because what happens to Vodafone does determine what happens in the whole market because it's such a huge company. Again, it's risen over the year. Uh, what's happening with it this week? It's key performance indicators, which is a bit of a mouthful. Right. That's not its profit figures, then? No, no. It's just a whole raft of figures that they look at that are important to see how, how well the business is doing overall. For example, the number of subscribers they've got, uh, how long those subscribers are staying on air, something they call ARPU, which is average revenue per user, so right. how much people are spending. And the, the whole so that should give us a very good idea of what's going to happen to these, uh, these guys' profits. It should do, yes. And are you positive or negative about what you think is going I'm, to happen? I'm fairly positive. I would expect good numbers. The indications are that sales were okay over Christmas. And, uh, but they need to be quite good because the share price had quite a good run. But, well, which is ex the exact point, isn't it? When the share price has gone high and everyone's saying, oh, this is great and the sector is great, in fact, surely that's the time when you shouldn't be piling into this company because all the good news is in that price and it only takes a slight mistake there or a slight deviation from what people are expecting for the share price really to start heading down. I think it depends on, on each share. Uh, you have to take each one on its individual merit. Very often the figures can be even better than expected and that can then lead the share yeah. to sort of take an initial bounce up and then carry on going up. I don't think you could you can say black and white. No, no. no. Obvi obviously otherwise it would be easy to make, make a fortune. But what's your view on Vodafone then? I'd still be a buyer, um, although I'm getting a little bit less optimistic than I, than I was 12 months ago because the shares have done so well. But uh, still for now a buy, but, but I would Certainly, once they get to sort of 170, 180 level, I start to think about maybe taking well, a profit. We're, we're below 160 now, so quite a way to go there. Mm. Well, what about that sector? Because there's not a huge amount of companies in the sector, but the telecom sector has been enormously volatile. It's not been great if you go back further than a year, in fact. Well, what do you think about the sector? Because it was one which was just bombed out. It was, but it's looking up now. I mean, the, the economy is recovering, and what that means is that companies, which are a key determinant of the spending in this sector, are actually now starting to loosen their own purse string and spend more on telecoms equipment. So I think the sector's looking up. Uh, if you look at something like Marconi, that share's actually done very well over a year. Yeah, over a year. You have to yeah. pick your time scale correctly, well, Marconi, because that's been a nightmare. Previous to that was a disaster, but it's kind of a, it's in the same business as it was, but it's now debt-free, it's refinanced, so it, it may be carrying a sort of, uh, 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 you know, bad points from, yeah. from the path, but, but it actually looks quite good now. Cable and wireless, um, an another one with uh, news coming out next week. Again, not profits, are they? What, what's coming out with cable and wireless? These are just um, uh, trading figures for right. the third quarter, so uh, we're expecting reasonably good numbers. And again, the shares have done quite well. Well, so they they look, I mean, quite well. Uh, master of understatement there. Look, they were ha hovering around 50 about a year ago. We're now, the next thing on that graph is 160. I'd love to have been in that share. Well, absolutely, yes. Um, but again, you don't, you don't get scared. I mean, I just get scared when you see a rise like that. You go, I've, you've missed that if you're not in it. It's, it's very easy to think that, but that's not always the case. I mean, very often the shares fell too far in the first place. And the reason there's risen is because things are actually genuinely improving. I mean, they were hemorrhaging huge amounts of cash out of the U.S. operations. They now have a strategy for getting out of that. So, you know, a massive part of the business losing a lot of money, losing a lot of cash. Now it's not. The rest of the business... So, again, another good. one you'd actually buy into? I would, yeah. You're going to have no money left you the way <laughs> you're buying shares. Uh, and finally, another company coming out with figures next week, Friends Provident. Briefly, what do you think? I like Friends Provident. They're making a lot of money by selling products to IFAs. Uh, I like the sector because it's, it's, it's geared to the economy and uh, everything's improving there. So, another buy. Another buy. Another buy. In the second half, we'll try and find some shares Damien isn't willing to buy, but for the moment, Damien, thanks very much. Now, uh, pulling a pint used to be a simple business, uh, but in a high-tech world, serving beer has moved into the 21st century. Computers, infrared monitors, and mobile phone technology are now being used to ensure you get a perfect pint every time. So I've been to a club which boasts that it sells as much beer as four normal pubs combined to see what these systems actually do. Welcome to Harlequin's Rugby Club. 
While I'm pulling you a pint, have a look at some of the latest in beer technology. What you can see on the screen is the temperature of the pint I'm pulling, the speed at which I'm pulling at the time there, and various measures of the quality of the pint. And it's not just to make sure that you're getting the perfect pint of beer, it's to ensure that it's produced for you as efficiently as possible. For the general manager at Harlequins, John McBride, there are two advantages. He can monitor the several bars here from his office or from anywhere in the country. And when the lines to the pumps are flushed clean, the system tells him as soon as pure unsullied beer is running through again, so there's less waste. The quality obviously is, you know, is very important here. You can't be perceived as serving bad, a bad pint in a rugby club. However, from a business point of view, it enables me to control all the wastage, etc., on site and ensure that there is no, um, no wastage going through the bars on a daily basis. You're probably wondering why I'm swaying from side to side, but it is to show you another clever idea that is helping in the bar. Now, aided by an infrared sensor above me, this system is measuring, well, how many people come into the bar, first of all, but also my movements. So it shows where I go in the bar area. And that is valuable commercial information. This is what the Harlequin's pitch looks like most of the time, but on match days, the stands and the bars fill up. The people counters warn John how many staff to deploy in the bars, and they prove he's obeying the fire regulations. To achieve all this for a rugby team, there's been a team effort. I'm David Hume from Infrared Integrated Systems, IRIS is for short, and we supply the people counting solution for the brew line system. And I'm Mike Newnham from Orange, and we provide the network that ensures all the data and information gets to the right people at the right time. And I'm James Dixon from Brew Lines. We measure what goes on in pubs and allows the landlords to give the drinker a better experience. Cheers. Installing both systems would cost at least £3,500 plus a weekly fee, but they expect bars to make that back in the first year. You want to know if people are having to wait too long to be served for a drink. And the more people you can serve, the higher the profitability of a unit. As for the beer, Jim contends that only one in five pints are served perfect, unless there's careful monitoring. A pub is, as it's run in a traditional way, you'd only be able to sense from your fingers whether the temperature of the beer was the right temperature or not. And obviously you can't do that in every pint with all your staff members. And you certainly can't run around with a temperature thermometer and stick it in someone's pint. So this tells them that they're actually delivering a pint at the right temperature or not. And if not, they can go take action to correct it. Maybe all of this used to be part of the experienced bartender's art. But now it's become a science studied by big business in the interests of making a frothier profit. Simon there, if you're a business studies student and you want to know more about using technology, or if you're just generally interested in this. Anyway, um... <laughs> Yes, do check out our lunch lesson section of our website. Uh, that's all the w's.bbc.co.uk slash working lunch. There is also a video available of last term's lessons. I've put my mind back in now. Now, a quick look at the other uh, business news. Retail sales figures for December have rung up a much higher increase than expected, rising 0.0% on the previous month. Year on year, December retail sales were 4% higher. Good news for the shops, but it does increase the chance of another rise in interest rates, which could come soon. Uh, three out of four of us struggling to work when we're feeling unwell. The TU thinks, TUC thinks we all need reminding that we should stay in bed and not spread our germs amongst our colleagues. White-collar workers are more likely than manual workers to turn up when they're sick. And why do we do it? Because uh, we don't want to let the boss down, uh, or our colleagues down, or indeed lose pay. And for your weekend dose of personal finance, join Paul Lewis and the Moneybox team. That is on Radio 4 at midday tomorrow. Every Friday we like to bring you the biggest names here on Working Lunch and they don't much, uh, come much bigger than today's guest. It's why I'm all at sixes and sevens. I'm so nervous. We have Piers Brosnan, who you may recognise from his role as 007 James Bond. And never seen together, these two, Del Boy Trotter, Peckham's best-known would-be millionaire. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Now, in fact, of course, we can't really afford, I'm afraid, Piers and Del Boy, so in best showbiz tradition, before we have a look at something else, let uh, them tell you... Uh, who you are and where do you come from, sir? James, Douglas James. But today, Adam, I'm <laughs> going to be Piers Brosnan. <laughs> Good, very much. <laughs> <laughs> right, well, my name is Stephen Feats, right, and I come from Derby. 
<laughs> he who dares wins, doesn't he? <laughs> Lovely jabby. Uh, very good. Uh, now, look, more from them in a moment. Lookalikes uh, is getting a big industry uh, these days. The Weakest Link even had a special show featuring celebrity doubles. Uh, let's have a look at a bit of that. Uh, there is uh, Tony Blair, Marilyn Monroe, Jamie Oliver, uh, posh, uh, not with Bex. Uh, the, oh, no, there is Bex. There he is. Uh, the Queen, uh, Elton John. Go on, Elton. Uh, Joan Collins. And finally, Chris Tarrant. How fantastic. Um, it's a brilliant thing here. Uh, Piers, uh, do, you, do you like to be called Piers? Whatever. Whatever. Call right. me. Let's, let's, call you, let's call you Piers then. Uh, you, you not only are a lookalike, but you also run an agency for lookalikes. That's right, isn't it? That's correct. But when did all this start? Because I don't remember it always being a big deal. Celebrity lookalikes have been around for a long time now. It started with um, a lookalike of the Queen. It was actually used by a photographer about 25 to 30 years ago, and it's grown since then. Anytime someone wants to do a promotion, and they can't afford possibly the real item, they can come along to a celebrity lookalike agency and book one of our artists. Is that, what, is that how people are used? It's, it is because companies can't afford the, the real McCoy? Well, not only that, they want people to be at different events, maybe at the same time that the real artist is going to be. Oh. So they want to promote their event at the same time, and the illusion is created that that's the real person there. Who, who are the most popular <coughs> ones? I mean, is, is Dell quite popular? Dale's always very popular, um, travels very well, he's uh, good to handle <laughs> and uh, we have to be very careful because if he shows you on the inside he's always trying to yeah, make right, extra yeah. money uh, when he's at work, yeah, he's always well, you know. selling watches. And this is things. Albanian gold pal, you see, <laughs> right. normally retails at 4 .99. to you today 2 .99, All right. Very nice to <laughs> So, so there is a sideline yeah. for the lookalikes <laughs> yeah. when they're down the market. However, the majority of the time, it could be for corporates to promote their item, to promote their product, or at a spoof Oscar ceremony where they will have uh, movie star lookalikes come along and give them to the best salesman of the day, the best uh, secretary, and different things like that. Del boy. Mm -hmm. uh, lucrative thing to be in? Well, yeah, you know, I mean, I used to be a lorry driver in Derby, <laughs> and... Um, Obviously, you know, I was working all the hours God sent to, uh, to make a decent wage and then right. obviously, you know, I contacted old Douglas here and he sort of been out with a few swan doonies for only a couple of hours a week. Right. When did you first realise you, you, had, you had this talent? I mean, do you imitate a lot of other people? No, no, it's just Del Boy. I don't find there's a, much of a call for Jack right. Frost or, um, right. or Granville, really. But, so when, yeah. but when did you actually realise you could do this? I mean, you were a lorry driver for years then. Well, that was right. Um, the first job I ever had, really, I was a nurse. And, um, and it was my mother that uh, actually rang me up and said, oh, there's a guy on the television who looks just like you, you know. And that's when he was playing uh, Granville with Ronnie Barker in Open All Hours. Right. Um, and obviously being a youngster, when we finished work, it was straight down the pub, you know, so I never actually really got a chance to see it. But when I did see it, I thought, yeah, I suppose I do of it, you know. But there was still no call for lookalikes, really, in those days. It's only since the success... So what sort of, of work you know, do you actually do, then? Who, who wants a Del Boy turning up? <laughs> Well, I've got one in London tonight, actually, yeah. on Who's the that for? Okay. It's, uh, it's a corporate organisation. I <laughs> forget the name, actually. Yeah, can you remember? <laughs> right. um, I, I mean, do, do, is it something you can literally earn a lot of money? I mean, are you incredibly wealthy people these days, or is it Depends be better, on... than, better than truck driving? Oh, it's better than truck driving. Yeah. I mean, if, if you work it out on an hourly basis um, and, and you take all your, you know, your yeah. travelling time out of that, if you actually said what well, I earn for an hour, it's about 200 quid an hour. Right and it's a minimum of two hours, which is 400 quid, obviously, but, um, you know, that's not including any... I mean, the, the other thing is, you're actually a good imitator of him as well, but it strikes me that a lot of, of lookalikes are actually... I mean, I don't want to be rude about it, but there isn't a lot of skill involved. They happen to look like the character. No, is that fair? No, looking like the character is only one element. They do have to put across the whole thing. If Stefan came in today looking as good as he did, but just speaking with a completely... <laughs> yeah different accent. We do that in the past tense because yeah. he always plays up like that. Yeah. But as Luke, looking as good as he does, <laughs> if he comes in and he can't do anything, if he didn't have his props with him, because yeah. oh, no, he's always yeah. on the mobile phone, yeah. he wouldn't do the act. You wouldn't really buy it. If he yeah, spoke but there must, with there a Welsh or a Scottish accent... There are just like that. They there actually are a few. can't do that. There are a few like that. We can use those for photographic, but the majority of the big earners are the people who look and act like it. Mm -hmm. Because the people expect, for all intents and purposes, if you book David Beckham, he's got to be able to kick a ball. He's got to be able to know what he's doing, have the same hair, the same clothes as the character. And do, 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 the, do the actors, do the lookalikes actually often like the people themselves? They do. Um, quite often they have many of the characteristics, dare I say, um, 
David Beckham stringing sentences together, some of our guys um, are just as good <laughs> stringing right. two, three words right. together to make a sentence with us. Um, use of mobile phones, etc. Yeah. We, we heard a lot from, from Dell. Can, can you do a James Bond? Sure I can, but you know, depends what comes out. <laughs> Something comes up always. <laughs> what the dip <laughs> But it's for England, not for Peckham, you know? Okay, gentlemen, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. And it's the real Simon Gompertz here. And today's consuming issue is all about tax, boo, hiss. But there's some very good questions here. And Patrick Stevens is a tax partner at Accountants Ernst & Young, here to answer some of your questions. First of all, Kevin Ryan is a 40% taxpayer and has in excess of £7,900 losses in shares for this tax year with no gains, unfortunately for him. Can he offset this against tax pay? Now, I presume what he's talking about offsetting yeah. capital gains losses against income tax. That, I think, is what he's talking about here. And the answer is very probably, I'm afraid, no, he can't. For individuals, there are two distinct tax regimes. There's the capital gains tax regime, where you make profits or losses on selling shares or property. And there's the income tax regime, where you get charged a tax on your wages, salary, dividends, interest, all of that. And in the main, there's a big dividing line between the two. So. In this case, in most circumstances, he won't be able to offset those losses. One quick exception, if the shares that he sold and made a loss on were not a quoted company, private company, carrying on a business which wasn't just investment but trading, and he originally got the shares by subscribing for new shares in the company rather than buying them from someone else, then maybe those losses can be converted into income losses and can be set off against his salary. Okay, so generally a no. Generally. Another one here, when Claire Knowles moved into a bigger house in 1998, she kept her previous property for letting. Claire is now thinking about selling and wants to know how she'll be affected by capital gains tax. Now, Claire bought the property for £80,000 and it's now worth £150,000. What she hasn't told us is what it was worth when right. she stopped living it in it as, as her main residence. But this is an interesting question, isn't it? It is. Lots of people get very worried about capital gains tax because they don't often bump into it. But in fact, as taxes go, it's actually quite a generous sort of tax. This is a good example. So most people know that if you sell your own house that you've been living in, you don't pay tax on it because there's a special exemption for your principal residence, as it's called. Here, there's one period of time when it was her principal residence and another period when it wasn't. So first of all, you look at the whole profit that she's made and divide it between the two. And you do that on the amount of time when it was and the amount of time when it wasn't her uh, principal residence. Then all of these exemptions start kicking in. So, first of all, there's a three-year gift that they give you for nothing. So you're allowed to take three years out of the taxable bit and put it in non-taxable. Well, for her, that would get rid of most of it, really. That, that would. Even after that, you take taper relief, which is available for all capital gains. The longer you hold something, the less tax you pay. So if she sells the property before this April, she'll be able to knock another 15% off what we've got to here as taxable. If it's after April, 20%. Then she'll be able to take a thing called indexation allowance because she owned it before 1998. I mean, it's, it's time, complicated, but what you're is. basically saying is don't be too worried about don't this be because you worried. can slice off those... She, Levels of income she, she, against she tax will quite have happily. very little left to pay at the end of the day. In order to sort all this out, she's probably best to either get an accountant or tax advisor to help or go along to your local inland revenue. They'll help you. You can find the uh, address and phone number in the phone book. Brilliant. Angela Massey cohabits with her boyfriend in a house which they jointly own. Is it true that in the event of one of them dying that the other would have to pay inheritance tax on the total value of the property? This is an important one, isn't it? It is, but no, don't worry. Hold on. If someone dies, you have to pay inheritance tax on what they own at the date of death. Uh, in some cases, you have to look back and see whether they've given anything away in the previous seven years, but that probably doesn't apply here. But it's only what you own. If she owns it jointly, then either they own it 50-50 or in some other proportion, it's whatever proportion she owns that you add in to the value of your assets. But uh, husband and wife, they can transfer ownership without anything, and also they, when they die. Absolutely. Um, if you are cohabiting, is there a difference there? There certainly is. You don't get this exemption from inheritance tax that you do between husband and wife. It's, it's one of the main reasons that there is a tax advantage to being married rather than cohabiting. Quick last one. Martin Cam, 
uh, understands that from April it will not be possible to recover the 10% tax credit on dividends from shares held in PEPs. Will they have to declare such dividends on income tax returns if the holder is a higher rate taxpayer? Um, what then? PEPs and ISAs, I suppose. ISAs, exactly the same. No, don't worry. You won't get the 10% uh, uh, tax back unless the Chancellor changes it back again in the budget, which he might do. Um, but you still don't have to pay extra tax on top of that. You've still got the ISA and PEP exemption from other income tax, capital gains, so don't worry about that. A lot of people are interested in that because you do lose out from it. Yep. But uh, thanks for that, Patrick, and we'll be back to you later on. Bye. Wonderful. See you later. Uh, time to turn up the heat on Gillian again for her weekly grilling. Uh, Gillian, last week we discussed how you can benefit from the weak dollar uh, by looking at how much you'd have to spend before you covered the cost of a flight going off to New York or, or something. Several people got in touch. Uh, good question. They, they asked us to clarify the limits on how much you can legally bring back with you, because it's all very well and good saying you'd make a, you, it's worthwhile if you bring back £10,000 worth of goods, but are you allowed to? You phrased that very, very delicately. Thank you very much. But I have to put my hands up here and say mea culpa. What I was saying was last week that you should bring back one thousand. If you bring back £1,400 worth of goods, roughly speaking, with the dollar being as weak, you get your free weekend in America and you will have paid for it. And hypothetically, of course, that is absolutely true. But luckily, we have some vigilant views viewers out there who wrote and said, oi, hang on a minute, Gillian, hypothetically, you may well be right, but it is only hypothetically, because if you brought back £1,400 worth of goods from the US, customs and excise would not be too pleased. So I've checked this out, chapter and verse, and yes, the viewers are absolutely right. The limits are £145 worth of goods is all you can bring back yeah. per person from the US. So you mm. would, in fact, as an individual, be 10 times over the limit right. with that. But you can bring that back per person, and that includes children as well. So every single individual in your party can bring that back. But a very important point is that it's not cumulative. So if you bought something for if I bought something for three hundred pounds, which was. I don't know, something that's very clearly mine, a dress. Yes, that would clearly be <laughs> yours, Julia. Then my husband couldn't say, well, half of that is, dress is mine. On the other hand, if we had two things which were £145, that's absolutely fine as long as one of them is his. Um, that's one point. The second point, which really shocked me, actually, was that apparently customs and excise are so strict that they could theoretically, even if you bought a product from, say, Germany the week before, and remember in the EU you could bring back as much as you want if it's only for you, yes. and then go to America, but you've bought a necklace or something that still looks new, customs and excise could theoretically, if you don't have the receipt on you and you can't prove it was bought in Germany, confiscate it. Yeah. So be very, very careful and keep receipts with you if it wasn't actually bought there. OK. Uh, a, view, uh, a few viewers, including Bob Rogers, contacted us about a scam where a caller... Uh, uh, phones you, claiming to be from a credit card company, Visa or MasterCard. He says he wants to verify an unusual purchase pattern. So actually looking like he's actually trying to protect you. He then says, uh, can you read out some of your credit card numbers? Mr. Rogers, unfortunately, gave out the crucial numbers and within minutes somebody had fraudulently used uh, his card to make a purchase. So really, I th uh, the, the question is, what do you do? Be extremely vigilant. I mean, this is an email that is doing the rounds at the moment, which is a good email rather than a bad email, saying, look, be careful, this is what's happened to me. So if you get this email, worth reading. But, I mean, I was surprised by how very authoritative the whole thing sounds. Let me read you a little bit. This is from one case study. Somebody says that someone called up, called Carl Patterson. I'm ringing from the security and fraud department at Visa. My badge number is this. Your card has been flagged as an unusual pattern. It all sounds very, very credible. The thing to bear in mind is Visa... Visa and MasterCard do not ring you. Right. The moment they sense Visa and MasterCard, you know it's a fraud because Visa and MasterCard have a relationship with the bank. They do not have a relationship with you and they do not necessarily even know who right. you are. Um, and your bank will not ring you either to n ask you what your credit card details are because, of course, they know what your credit card details are. So the moment that happens, however authoritative they sound, I would just put the phone down and say thank you very much. End of story. Straightforward advice, Gillian. Thanks a lot. Uh, it is coming up to half past 12, 12.28, in fact. You're watching Working Lunch. Good afternoon, I'm Adam Shaw. Coming up in the next half hour of Working Lunch, Tesco is willing to spend £54 million on your local corner shop. It's planning to take over some of the big names in small stores, Hearts, Europa and Cullens, but there are calls for the competition authorities to block the deal straight away. Looks like the FTSE will end the week down and figures showing the economy is growing faster than expected are fanning the interest rate rise. 
It's going to be cold, very cold next week, so you'll need some heating. There's a cost to keeping warm, but there is some help in trying to cover it. And we'll be tackling your tax queries with the help of this man, Patrick Stevens, from this man, from Ernst and Young. And Gerard's planning a new holiday after his income went up by £100 a week. When he applied for benefits, he never knew he was entitled to. But how many more people are missing out? Yeah. Where's this one? Avanti Hotel. Yeah, I, I, say lo that. I, love to, I love to go. Like. <laughs> <laughs> Little conversation going on there. Uh, Tesco's been doing a bit of shopping of its own on the high street. It snapped up a string of convenience stores called Ministore. It cost them £54 million. It's also not the first time Tesco has made a push into this convenience food store market, and it's proving rather controversial. Here's Gillian. Tesco is the undisputed leader of the supermarket sector, but it seems this isn't enough for them the chain has decided to beef up its presence in the smaller convenience niche as well. After buying TNS stores in the autumn of 2002, rivals thought that Tesco would be blocked if it even tried to increase its presence further. But so far it seems to be getting away with it. Its latest move is to snap up 45 stores trading under the names Europa, Cullens and Hart. The chains belong to two Asian entrepreneurs, Jitu Patel, and his unrelated business partner, Mahesh Patel. They'll be receiving £54 million for the deal. But the rest of the sector is furious. The Association of Convenience Stores thinks the deal should be blocked by the competition authorities. And marketing experts also worry that Tesco will end up shooting itself in the foot. I think this is a real mistake for Tesco. When you're very big, you want to keep quiet about it. You, want to say, you don't want people to realise that you are a giant who's uh, dominating the whole landscape. You want to be very, very smooth and calm. What they're doing now is drawing attention to themselves and the sheer dominance that they have in various markets. They will switch from being a friendly old Tesco that you can rely on to a giant that is just marching across the landscape and destroying everything else in its wake. Sounds bad, doesn't it? <laughs> Gillian is here. Are they a giant storming across the landscape, smashing everything in their wake? Or not? Well, they are a giant. Whether or not they smash everything in its wake remains to be seen. Um, but we can say that Virginia, about 10 days ago, went to a Londis store and spoke to a Londis owner, and he was certainly worried about the prospect of a Tesco coming along. He had one of the old TNS stores near to him, and he was telling Virginia at the time that if they converted to a Tesco, he would be worried that people would walk straight past his store and into the Tesco because it has such a strong mm. brand name. And other people are worried too. A big food group who own Iceland, you were saying mm -hmm. earlier in the program, have called for an investigation um, because, again, it would damage their brand. Tesco is such a monster that it stands head and shoulders really above anyone else at all. And the reason why they think they will get away without an investigation is a very interesting, I mean one could almost call it a loophole in the law. Let me just show you one very simple thing which is how the grocery market divides in the eyes of the Competition Commission. Because here they say it is two different markets, a one-stop shop and a top-up shop. Um, and if you, well, let's go through the market shares then. One, um, if you look, the big five have accounted before in 1998, which includes Tesco, for 47.7% of the market. And now, if you look at it, they have been growing inexorably, 56% of the market. Mm. And that's only going back to 1998. If you go back 20 years or so, they've virtually doubled their market share. And look at the second line of that. What's been happening is that the smaller grocers have been decimated basically they have gone from 10 percent not literally but down to three percent so they've lost two-thirds of their market mm. share so there are some dynamics going on here where the big are growing and the small are getting smaller but let me just return to this theme of the top-up shop versus the one stop shop what the competition commission said is that there are two entirely separate markets there is a one-stop shop which is where you go to do your weekly spend and you will spend about 70 pounds there for your family and then there is the top-up shop market and ne'er the twain shall meet, which in a lot of people's view is completely ludicrous because the two markets, it's the same suppliers, it's the same customers on the whole going to them, and it's the same products that are there. And so Tesco's is using this to say in the top-up market, the convenience market, it only has 6% market share. So it's not a giant striding across the landscape at all. It's a tiddler, only 6%. But what the others are saying is, no, you know, count the markets together and it's huge. Given all that, do you think there's going to be an investigation into this? I think it would be surprising if there wasn't. The FT has said if 
that somebody calls them officially, they will look at it. But what they could do, and this is what they did on the TNS stores, which was 800 stores Tesco's bought only a year and a half ago, was look into it initially and say, because of these two markets being separate, we'll throw it out. Good or bad for the consumer if this happens? Well, we heard Jeremy earlier saying it is bad for the consumer, that all we will get is homogeneity on the high street. You know, you'll go into a high street anywhere in the UK and it will all look identical. Tesco's, Marks and Spencer's, etc. And that's certainly a bad thing. But let's look at something very concrete. What do consumers care about? Most surveys show that if you were asked what would make you change supermarket, the answer is one very simple little word, price. So what we did was we uh, looked at prices this morning between two of these chains, Tesco's and the Hearts chain, which is part of the chains that have been bought. Looked at three different items. Here are the prices. A Mars bar, 32p in Tesco's, in Hearts, 45p. 41% different. Milk there, you can see a 33% difference. And the kilo of Granny Smith's, you can see, which was the least difference, was even that, virtually a third difference. So I wonder, if you go out to consumers and you say, mm. would you like this a third more expensive with lots of different yes. shops on the high street? Oh, or would you be willing to pay more? In, in market research studies, people always say, oh, we want green things, we want differences, variety, but when it comes to it and they vote with their pockets, they always choose the cheaper one. And from that point of view, in the short term, I think it's good news for the consumer. The long-term issue is a different one. Julian, thanks very much. Uh, some news just in, in fact, the Japanese electronics giant Panasonic says it's planning to end production of colour TVs and set-top boxes at its factory in Cardiff. The company says 600 employees out of a workforce of just over 1,000 would be affected. In a statement, uh, Panasonic says a combination of increasingly intense competition from global manufacturers and sharply falling prices is behind that move. A call centre which switched 250 jobs to India nearly two years ago has decided to move its operation back to the UK. Shop Direct said the level of customer services in Bangalore was not up to scratch. Unions who've been campaigning against the outsourcing of call centre jobs abroad welcomed the decision and uh, predicted it would be the first of many. We will see. Uh, more than a million Britannia Building Society members are to get a profit share bonus worth on average £38 each, depending on how much they save, borrow or invest. Members earn points, which entitle them to a share of the profits. Well, this year's members of the UK's second largest building society will share £42 million, with 80,000 receiving a windfall in excess of £100. Uh, the profit share has been in operation since 1997 and to date members have scooped windfalls totaling £330 million. Pounds. We're spending an average of £229 a year each on snacks to munch on the move. In fact, that's the highest in Europe. Nearly 40% of what we spend goes on snacks like crisps and takeaway meals, including fast food and sandwiches. And uh, don't forget, join us on Monday when we'll be kicking off a week of special reports about the business of spending and debt with a look particularly at a company called Experian. That's the UK's largest credit reference, uh, referencing agency. And that is at 12.30 on Monday. Uh, now, let's uh, go over to the market. It, it looks like uh, the market will end uh, the week down. Uh, there was an unexpectedly large rise in uh, economic uh, growth, uh, GDP. Uh, rose by 0.9% in the fourth quarter. It's its strongest rate in almost three years. Now, that means it's growing at over 3.5% per year. Looking, uh, I think we might be able to just have a quick look. It's just having a little run through, but if we have a look at some of the more widely held shares, what you'll probably see is that uh, uh, quite a high proportion of them are down today, and that does reflect a small fall in the FTSE 100, probably down around uh, five or six points, actually, today. If we have a look at those uh, popular shares, I think, there they go. Uh, yeah, quite a few of them down. ICI down a penny, Lloyd's TSB. M&S is up, Royal Bank of Scotland. So no huge trends actually being seen there. Some of the big movers today, Strata up 3%, Widbread up 2%. Anglo-American and Rio Tinto, the mining companies, uh, both up today. There's a pattern developing here. And the furniture store, DFS, uh, down 1.5%, one of the worst performers there. Looking over the week... Uh, these are some of the worst perform uh, sorry, the best performers. Scottish and Newcastle up 5%. Extrata, well, we've seen that perform very well today. 4% up. Whitbread up 4%. Aviva, sales at the life insurance company Aviva, they own Norwich Union, uh, reported a small rise in sales earlier on in the week, and we've seen their shares rise 3.5%. 
On the other side, uh, well, uh, interesting to see some media activity here, knocking them down. Pearson, which owned the FT, amongst others, down 7%. Granada, the TV company, down 7%. Shire and Barclays also down. Also looking back over the past five days, Shell had a worrying time. They sold their stake in an Indian oil field to Cairn Energy. Then uh, Cairn Energy found that, well, this thing they, they'd been sold actually had a potential 75 times more than was previously thought. And look at Cairn Energy go. 64, nearly 65% up on the week there. Uh, Summer Field, uh, well, we've, we've seen some of those. On the, uh, Dow, uh, on the FTSE 100, down 13 points, 4,464. I said it was going down. Such a shame that we're still now off this 4,500 level, but over the years still, market doing uh, very nicely. Damien Larkin, uh, stock broker from the Share Centre, is here. Uh, let's kick off with uh, Cairn Energy, uh, which has done enormously well. Um, another share you would buy to add to your growing portfolio? I sense a bit of scepticism there. Um, they found between 50 and 200 million barrels of oil, which is massive. So I th and the share price hasn't risen as much as it has, and it'll probably be a holder for now. Yeah. But I think at some point they could become a buy because they reckon they might even be able to find even more oil. A buy? A buy? I said a hold for now. These, look at these shares. It's like it's going up to six pounds. This has only happened in the past two days. But Adam, these shares don't just rise just for a whim. They rise for a fundamental reason. The size of this company could double right. just on the value of the oil they've found so far. And that's not including any f future oil. What they expect to get from the same area. OK. All right. Fair enough. Let's try this one on you. Aviva. Uh, well, again, it's done well over the year. Uh, now, I think they reported a small rise in sales, but the fact that they've risen at all, I suppose, is quite good. It is, yes, and in Europe they were even up 6%. Uh, the other good thing is that they were very optimistic for the rest of the year, so uh, I think actually they'll do well, and surprise, surprise, I rate them a buy. Right, OK. That's very nice. Uh, QXL. And uh, now look at that. It's a very odd performance going on here. It's much more one of the uh, smaller shares. So you do often get a lot of volatility yes, here. Yes, yes. That's probably when one person bought and that's when one other person bought. <laughs> the share went uh, what is it and why are you interested? Well, they're an online auctioneer, so they're very similar to a much bigger American company called eBay. Just, you, can, you, know, you can sell, for example, if you've got a computer that you want to sell, you can put it on the internet and, and, and people will bid for it. Um, the reason that they went up, and they went up 229% in one day, which is massive, right. um, is that previously people have thought they were going bust. It turns out they've actually made some money over the last quarter, uh, they've got some cash in the bank, and they said, crucially, we won't need to come to the market again to raise more cash. We'll be able to see our way to profitability quite smoothly. Uh, are they a buy? I actually think just hold for a moment because the rise of that magnitude is excessive. Oh, really? That scares you a bit, does it? Uh, GW Pharma, uh, another one. So, obviously, a pharmaceutical company. Well, there's been some movements in that sector this week, hasn't there? Yeah, it's interesting, this one. It's quite different to a lot of the other companies in the sector. It makes medical products based on cannabis. Right. And it's, it's one of the few people that's actually got a license to do this. And they're expecting approval for their first product in, at the end of, by the end of June. And that is for pain in multiple cirrhosis. And it's just delivered by a mouth spray. Right. And uh, they've got £32 million pounds in cash in the bank. Which but is presumably, I mean, that's not a secret information. That should be already in the share price. Well, the thing is, people worry about uh, when these approvals will come through from the government to actually, you know, market the product, and people have been worried that it might be delayed further. So, um, no, I think actually softly, softly, every time they get approval for a new drug, then people get a bit more, leave the shares go up, and then they wait for a while. So I'm actually very positive on that Okay, uh, very briefly, Luminar, a, a bar operator. It is, yes. It, it operates bars and nightclubs. Uh, good figures, uh, and also they've decided they're going to put, or they're very close to deciding, they're going to put casinos in a lot of their bars, which could be good for the profits. Uh, we haven't got to a share you want to get rid of. Is, is there one in the whole world? I you deliberately like selected sell? buys today, but maybe next time. All oh, right, none at all. Okay, fair <laughs> enough. There he goes, loaded down with shares on his way out of the studio. Damien, have a nice weekend. Now, a bit of snow on the ground and some icy weather next week may be exciting news for the kids, of course. But for families and elderly people with a home to heat, it can be an enormous worry. Simon's been looking at the help that is available. This time last year, winter struck with its full force as well. And there's always concern when this happens that heating will be a problem. It is with some people, you know, they can't stand it, you know, the cold weather. I think perhaps even if they've got the money, they're worried about how much the bill will be when it comes in. And that is the real problem. The service providers, the British gases of this world, shouldn't be allowed to cut people off in extreme cold weather. 
Here's the help you can get with your heating. First of all, the winter fuel payment. It goes to people of 60 and over. It's worth £200. And if you're 80 or over, you can qualify for an extra £100. And it's paid in advance. Then there's the cold weather payment. That's worth £8.50 a time. It's paid after freezing periods of weather. And it's means tested. There were 1.6 million cold weather payments made last year, so the help does get through, though not necessarily immediately, and because the rules are strict, it won't cover every time there's a big freeze. Well, Simon's here. Now, we're just talking a lot about it in the office because of cold weather snap about to happen in the southeast, but some parts of the country have already suffered. Yeah, there's been quite a lot of cold weather already, and a lot of the payments that have already been triggered have been in Scotland, several thousand um, already um, over the winter. Uh, the biggest ones, in fact, have been um, near Durham and in North Yorkshire just because there are higher concentrations of population. So about 33,000 um, people have been sent money because of the cold snap towards the end of December and beginning of January in that area too. So how do they decide if you're going to get these cold weather payments? Well, I mean, there's, there, there are quite a lot of hurdles um, to jump. I mean, it's, it's available for those who are 60 and over, for people who have children under five, um, if you're sick or disabled, if you are receiving income support, or if you've got the guaranteed element of pension credit, which is like it used to be income support anyway under that. Um, heading and then there are the temperature criteria <laughs> that it has to right. have been an average of naught degrees um, or less so freezing um, for seven days or forecast to be that uh, to be fair and if, if those criteria are satisfied then you will be sent eight pounds fifty Oh, right. The, the, this was my next question, really. You will be sent £8.50. You don't have to uh, don't understand have to, all of that and you, apply. You don't have to claim it, although if, if you're worried, then you should get in, in, in touch with social services or the benefits office. But it should come to you automatically. And the good news is that each time there is a cold snap like that over seven days, then you'll get another payment for each right. one. A any sort of simple advice you can give for people to in advance to keep warm? Because, I mean, this is, it's not, it is serious, isn't it? It's it is very serious, and we do have... Um, we do have the, the, the winter fuel payment now, which is fantastic. So you have some money in advance there. The other thing to, to, to remember is that there's a scheme called Warm Front, um, where you can apply for grants up to £2,500 to insulate your home in advance. So that will save you money if you do turn your heating on. OK. Uh, good luck. Stay warm. Thank you very much. Uh, claiming benefits can be a difficult task at the best of times, but if you're blind or partially sighted, it has its own problems. The RNIB, uh, Royal National Institute of the Blind in Nottinghamshire, has found that up to 70% of elderly people with sight problems in the area are missing out on what they're entitled to. So they've decided to do something about it. Rob. In fact, Adam, it's reckoned that around the country hundreds of millions of pounds in benefits will be going unclaimed. And when the RNIB did that survey here in Nottinghamshire, they found that out of 12,000 people who are blind or partially sighted, more than 8,000 of them weren't claiming the benefits they're entitled to. As a result, they've decided to team up with the pension service here in Nottingham and spread the word that these benefits are available. They're going out on this campaign to meet people face to face, and we've been out to meet someone face to face whose life has been changed completely by the news. Like thousands of pensioners, life after work has been a struggle for Gerard Oscovich. He survived by eating sparingly, cooking up vegetables and making soups. A Polish war veteran who came to Britain to fight with the Free Polish Army, Gerard had later worked for Boots as a repair engineer, but after retirement, he found that once he'd paid his rent and rates, he had just £27 a week to get by on. I've been spending just on the essential, like, like bread, marge, uh, jam, and I've been making my own cooking. Usually I've been making uh, uh, soups, like, you see, thick soups, like uh, vegetable soups or uh, rice and uh, uh, tomato soups, so something of that sort. That was filling. It didn't cost that much. And I just about managed. Gerard also has deteriorating eyesight, but after visiting a social centre for visually impaired people, he discovered he was entitled to benefits. In fact, he's now £92 a week better off. It's made a massive difference. He splashed out on new furniture and can't believe how things have turned around. Like a miracle now. I mean, difference. If that would have been 20 years ago, probably I would have remarried. <laughs> yeah, others. Well, all I'm just can say thanks, thanks ever so much to all the help I'm having it. Now, at the age of 81, Gerard's planning something he never thought he'd be doing, taking a Mediterranean holiday. And who knows who we might just meet out there. 
I'm joined by two key members from this campaign. With me is Deb from the Pension Service here in Nottingham, and we've also got Bill from the RNIB. Now, now Deb, when you go out and you meet people, what kind of reaction are you getting from them? Well, they're really pleased to be able to have face-to-face -face contact with someone from the pension service and I'm able to give them information on the benefits they can claim and then assist them with the form completion in order to receive those entitlements. And Bill, what's the thinking behind this particular campaign actually getting out to meet people? Well, RNIB's research uh, identified that 8,400 blind and partially sighted people weren't claiming the benefits. And we view the partnership as, as absolutely fantastic, you know, the partnership between the pension service and the local society for the blind. We've identified basically that blind and partially sighted people are having practical problems in filling forms out, for example, and the face-to-face -face element and the work that Deb's doing by going out to actually meet blind and partially sighted people and assist them is just absolutely incredible. And we, we hope, you know, to see more partnerships and um, we just uh, can announce today that we actually are going to start a new partnership in February in Liverpool which is really brilliant. Well obviously there's a, there's a need for it around the country generally then is there? There is actually because the money that blind and partially sighted people receive in additional benefits can actually help their independence for example just getting a taxi to go out and see grandma or in Jared's case you know a holiday or being able to eat properly these are all vital things that uh, blind and partially sighted people are missing out on. So, yeah, we, 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 we really would like to see more partnerships. And Deb, do you find that people aren't aware of what they can claim and, and what, are, what things are available for them to claim? Absolutely. I mean, people have not necessarily had contact with the pension service prior to, to speaking to me. And they do have difficulties filling in the forms. Talking to people on the phone um, at the benefit office can be difficult, whereas being face to face, we can have a, a proper conversation and it, the service is open to them. And it's, it's something people often don't want to do, is it? Because particularly, I gather 90% of people um, with sight problems are, are over 60, so they're the kind of people that don't particularly want to be claiming benefits, so you have to overcome that too, I guess. Yes, people are sometimes reluctant to claim. They, they have misconceptions, they don't realise what their entitlements are, and they don't know how to access these entitlements. So obviously being able to speak to someone uh, in person is, is a great boost to them. Um, I mean, I'm able to see people in their homes, or I'm at, able to see people at the base that I work from, at the Nottinghamshire Royal Society for the Blind. And what this is also doing, Rob, is it's encouraging blind and partially sighted pensioners to uh, use the word of mouth elements, recommendations. You know, I've had a good service, Jared will say, um, and he'll o hopefully express that to other blind and partially sighted pensioners who we can reach with the service. Okay, Bill and Deb, thanks very much. We're going to leave the last word actually with our pensioner from earlier on, Gerard, and this is his advice for anyone who's sat at home watching this and wondering whether they can apply. I would advise you just to apply for it. Well, I know how you feel because I didn't apply neither. I didn't have the nerves to ask for anything. But if you're entitled to, you can, well, do it. Because it makes your life easier when you when you're coming uh, old as I'm getting some people probably even older than me yeah makes their life easier please try it ask for that help you're entitled to and it was great meeting Gerard by the way we've got a couple of numbers you can ring if you're in Nottinghamshire you can call 0115-970-6806 that's 0115-970-6806 970-6806, but that's only if you're in Nottinghamshire, but if you're outside Nottinghamshire, you can ring the Pension Service National Helpline, that number is 0845 6060 0845-6060-265, that number covers the whole country, and uh, the best of luck to you. Thanks very much, and we'll try and make sure they're on our CFAX pages, if not now, a bit later on in the day. Well, tax is the issue consuming us today, and tax partner Patrick Stevens from Ernst & Young is still with us. Um, let's crack on. Philippa Morrill has just uh, set up a limited company right. and wants to know where she should start when it comes to tax. And she's talking really here about her personal tax and also limiting the tax the company has to pay. Any easy advice? Well, just ought to start off with those words that strike fear into the heart of taxpayers everywhere. You'll probably need a, an, accountant. an accountant or, <laughs> or tax advisor yeah. to help you with this because yeah. you've got two entities, you're, Philippa herself and her company, yeah. and each one has got their own income and expenditure. Each one's got to do their own tax return, and of course, being tax, 
both returns are very different to sure. each other. But the things that she, she needs to watch out for really early on is make sure that you keep full records, um, particularly the income and expenditure of the company probably needs a, new, a bank account for the company itself yeah. to keep things separate. Tax-wise, if money is coming out, either to Philip who on a regular basis or to other employees get a PAYE system set up because the company has to act as tax collector on behalf of the government and pay it over and if you pay out money and you forget to deduct PAYE they do get a bit nasty about that. Also VAT, if your income, the amount coming into you is more than 56,000 you will have to do, uh, register for VAT. We're about the company here. The company. The company is earning doing more than the 56,000 pounds. That, that's right. Inco and, and that's a total amount yeah. of income coming in before expenses. Yeah. And if you don't do that, it can be costly to you and customs can get a little bit nasty. Very, very briefly, it, the trick by paying uh, the, the, the owner of the company in dividends rather than pay uh, yeah. as a way of reducing taxes, is that still a possible trick to play? It is always something which is very carefully worth looking at. The trouble is that right at the moment the law is in a state of flux. In the pre-budget report in December they said they were going to change yeah. the way they were going to deal with this and so we can only wait for the law to come out and see what they're going to do. Fair enough. Okay, so Chris Jones, he'd like to know whether there's a tax advantage to be had from an offset mortgage. Now, an offset mortgage is when you put your savings and your mortgage together, isn't it? Yeah, well, they only charge you interest on the bigger amount, or the, the net amount, which is your mortgage. So they take away the savings before charging the interest. And there is actually a little tax benefit to this, because think about it, if you're getting interest on your savings, you pay tax on it. If you pay out a larger amount of interest on your mortgage, there's no tax relief on interest on mortgage. So by setting them off, there's no tax to pay because there's no interest coming in and a smaller amount of interest being paid out, non, uh, which is non-tax relievable. So also, it's a good idea from a tax point of view to have an offset So you get mortgage. a double benefit effectively, yeah. one on the interest rate and one on the tax. Absolutely right, yes. Uh, sorry, Muriel Gateshill took early retirement from teaching, lives on her pension. Last year she took a temporary job for six weeks and got taxed. She wants to know now, will she get a rebate? Depends how much the pension is. Um, you have to look at it at the end of the tax year, 5th of April to 5th of April, if you remember, for individuals, and add together the pension and any other interest or dividends she receives and the amount of those earnings. And if she's still got um, the enough personal allowance, uh, 4,615 in a year this year, um, to wipe that out, then any tax that she paid on those earnings will be due back can't say because we don't know the amount but what she ought to do is to go around to the citizens advice bureau probably who are an excellent uh, set of people and can help in these sort of circumstances or around to the inland revenue and get it sorted out after 5th of April because it's only then that you can see what you've got for the whole year. Okay. Now Jackie Webb has a capital gains question she yeah. says is it possible to use capital gains tax allowance before April now and then use it again after April, i.e. could she get two hits in one calendar year? Yeah. Now what I think we're talking about here is the annual exemption. Everybody is allowed to get, to get capital gains of £7,900 free of tax. You can take it off. And that allowance runs for a given year, again 5th of April to 5th of April. Calendar year is irrelevant for these purposes. So the basic answer is yes, if you sell something or the other in March, deduct £7,900, sell something in April after the 5th, deduct another £7,900. Good news. Uh, Margaret Pannell is on state pensions, wants to know what is the amount of savings she's allowed before she has to pay income tax? Right, well... Does it, it matter your savings? It's your income, not your savings. Uh, yeah, well, she wants to know how much tax she is going to have to pay right. on the savings or whether she's got to uh, pay any at all. And the, the answer is, it depends how much pension. If it's just the state pension, it's one thing, but there may be pensions coming in from other places as well. Because all pensions are actually taxable. Um, and depending on what level your total pensions are, then you have to add on the savings as well. And then you take off your allowance that I was talking about earlier to see whether there is something left. And the amount of allowance is different depending on the amount of age. Um, up to 65, it's one set. 65 to 74, another, 74 onwards, more allowances are available. Also, I would say to her, don't forget the pensions credit. 
if you haven't got lots of other income you may well be entitled to the new pensions credit as well and getting the uh, pensions people to help you work that out can often be a good idea OK, briefly also, something to do this weekend, unfortunately, do your tax return, don't you? You do indeed. 31st of January is the absolute deadline, otherwise it's fines for you. OK, 100 quid fine, isn't it? It is. Yeah, OK, well, that's fantastic use of the weekend. Thank you very much <laughs> indeed. Uh, don't forget any useful numbers, addresses, all that we've mentioned on the programme. Uh, should be able to find on our CFAX page, which is BBC2 CFAX page 238. Oh, there it is. Also have a look at our programme website, which is... BBC, www.bbc.co.uk slash working lunch. I only I gave you that to read out and you got it wrong. Oh, I did. On consuming <laughs> issues next week, we'll be focusing on your debt questions as part of our week-long look at uh, uh, the part debt plays in our lives. Very important, so do watch that. If you want to get in touch, you can write to us at the regular address, which is working lunch, room 420, BBC TV Centre, London, W12, 7RJ. You can fax us on that number or email us at, go on, Gillian working.lunch at bbc.co.uk. Got that one right. Take care. Have a great weekend. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.